thinking about the shopping that you need to do and all of the tests that are piling up and that you will have to correct sometime tomorrow. So thank you for uh, sharing some of that precious weekend time with us uh, and for being interested in the kind of things we're going to talk about today. So what are we going to talk about today? This is going to be basically an excuse. This is going to be an excuse to start a conversation about one of the areas of, of Cambridge exams and assessment in general that, cr that creates a lot of mystery, that has an aura around it, and that is writing. And not so much what, I mean, writing as how do we teach it, blah, 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 but writing in terms of how is that corrected? What happens? Because there is, we hear that a lot, that there are many questions around what, especially in an exam like FIRST, that has this <coughs> weight and presence and sort of importance to it and relevance for many people. Uh, for many people, it is the last exam, sort of the highest level they will be tested at. For some people, it is what I call the first and last. It is the first exam they ever do, the last exam they will ever do. Uh, and, for, and for many, this is the exam that marks the end of secondary school or the end of a process of learning, the point, sort of a long-term goal where they said, I'm going to study a lot and I'm going to sit for this exam. There are many expectations and there is a lot of relevance put into the exam, which we value and cherish and try to honor as best as we can. Um, but then there is this thing, and we hear that a lot, like what happened? I mean, how is it possible that this learner got this exam? And how is it this result? And that this happened with writing for this candidate, which was great, or that this other thing happened? Well, we are not, we, we do not go into one-on-one -on -one explanations of what happened to Pedro, Susana, or Miguel, but we can talk about what we are going to talk about today, which is how and why do we assess writing the way that we do at first, but many of the things that we will say will most definitely apply to any Cambridge exam. And some of the things we say will apply, and we will also be talking about how to assess writing in general and ways to do it. So many of the things that we say today will probably be sort of very interesting to you, regardless of whether you're, I mean, will, will be interesting practices and approaches to incorporate into the way you develop writing in your lessons and the way in which you assess writing as you go, your ongoing assessment of writing and the way you give feedback to your learners towards exam preparation or not. So without further ado, because we're sharing it in Teams, let me try out doing it this way. So it's going to take a while, but there are a couple of cool features of Teams versus Zoom that I would like to test. Uh, if you bear with me. Um, so. Here, you should be looking at my slides. Yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. if I do this right, let me see if I can do my favorite trick. Are you, do, do you see me hovering around your screens at the corner, sort of doing a, like a Indeed. weird thing? Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> My favorite feature, good. So, um, okay, cool. So this could fail. If it fails, we're going back to regular screen sharing, but I just wanted to try out, to try it out. It's a cool toy. So, um, okay. No, so, uh, so first of all, some exciting news. Uh, I used to work for Cambridge Assessment English. I used to. Uh, I don't anymore because now I work for Cambridge University Press and Assessment. So a very exciting piece of news, which is that our learning side and our assessment side have now merged and the University of Cambridge has decided that Cambridge Assessment and Cambridge University Press are now going to be working together. Why is this exciting and why should anybody care? This is going to bring us lots of opportunities to basically to, to basically incorporate and sort of change the way we approach our work in English a lot. And it, you're going to start seeing, there are already a lot of things happening, but you will start seeing more things where um, there is there are learning materials and assessment that 
come together. There are courses that incorporate a lot of assessment and that incorporate digital uh, platforms where you can assess as you go. And this is going to be transformed in, in lots of ways. Uh, in a sense, nothing is changing, but in a, but in the sort of moving forward, lot, this is going to enable lots of exciting things to happen. So our new promise to you is that Cambridge is where your world grows for you and for all of our learners. So that on the Cambridge side of things. But we're going to be talking today about myth busting, be the first writing, and this is going to be um, sort of, and this is going to be all of the things that I said before. We're going to be talking about basically three things, or we're going to start narrowing things down. We're going to be talking about B2 first. We do not, I mean, Cambridge exams, as you probably know, have these letters put into it that you must have seen in your course books, which are like B2, A2, C1. And it sounds like we're all playing uh, we're all playing a big game, a big board game, where it's more like V2 Nido or something. Uh, and, um, but uh, what the, where this comes from is the Common European Framework of Reference. So we're going to be talking about uh, the, mm, we're going to be talking about uh, what that means. We're going to be talking about what the, what level B, how level B2 is defined. We're going to be talking about what, and then we're going to be talking more specifically about how writing at B2 level is defined. The Common European Framework works with descriptors, the famous can-do statements. So we're going to be looking at what are those statements for level B2. And we're going to be look, I mean, we're going to be looking at some of the many descriptors which are in there to give us a sense of what is actually expected at this level. And then we're going to be looking at B2 first writing. And we're going to be looking at what happens at B2 first, sort of what are the tasks, which I know you know, but we're going to talk about why they are there. And we're going to be looking at the uh, descript, sort of the, uh, uh, the assessment criteria or B2 first. What are the things that raters for written for for B2 first writing are looking at when they are assessing? And we are also going to be busting some myths as we go. Um, so, but first, let's talk about understanding B2. And throughout, you've got the chat box available. So, any questions that you have. Just put them in the chat box and we're going to be, some of them I will be picking up as we go. Some of them we will be, uh, we may, I may be leaving towards the, I may be leaving for the end and we can have a Q&A set and we can, well, when we can have some time specifically for talking about any questions that you've got. But please use the chat box, it's all yours. Uh, it feels weird, as you know, when you're teaching a lesson and nothing is happening, and sort of there is no noise in the background. So, but so please keep the chat box lively. So, let's look first at the global scale descriptor. So, this is um, just a minute. Yep, no, no, we're in the right place. Oops. Sorry, I'm just getting used to this thing. <laughs> so uh, this is what the global scale descriptor for B2 first level is in the Common European Framework. This is the broadest description of the level. And this is what is called the self-assessment statement. So this is the non-technical version of things. So a B2, a, a B2 user of language is what is defined, described as an independent user. And this is the level at which they can understand the main ideas of complex, of complex text on both concrete and abstract topics, including technical discussions in his or her field of specialization. So there is some degree of specialization, but we are still at the level of more general English. And we're talking about main ideas in complex texts, and we're talking about both concrete and abstract. They can interact with a degree, with a degree of fluency and um, Sim 
Well, that spontaneity, sorry, uh, this is showing up very small on my screen, so my my short sightedness is playing tricks on me. Uh, can interact with a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction with native speakers quite possible without strain for either party. Notice that it says a degree of fluency of spontaneity. So it, this means some. We are not expecting perfect. No one is ever expecting perfect. But the idea is that they can communicate without strain on either part. This means that they are not making a massive effort putting their ideas together and that the speaker doesn't have to make a massive effort trying to understand what they are trying to say. There will be things in which they are not using the best sort of, not the best, but the most um, specific resources. They may not be using the most specific uh, grammatical way of doing things. They may not be using the most specific collocation or language or um, or tense or whatever. And there will be opportunities in which they're just saying things that are not exactly the right way to say this and everybody knows it, but the meaning is clear and the other person will understand. As we move forward, if you were talking about a C1, C2 learner, you would be, you would definitely be expecting the right tools for the job. But at this point, we are still talking about, I can make myself understood. We are, B2 is still at that level. Actually, the independent in independent user is, that means that for most situations, I can make myself understood. Regardless of how I do it, and for a broad range of situations. They can produce clear, detailed text on a wide range of subjects, and we are going to go much deeper into this, and explain a viewpoint on a topical issue, giving the advantages and disadvantages of various options. So, this last bit, the viewpoint on a topical issue, giving the advantages and disadvantages of various options, uh, explains one of the things that we keep hearing uh, all the way from 2015, which is, why do you have an essay in first? Well, this is exactly the reason why we have an essay, because this is specifically embedded in the, um, in the framework. So we are testing to these standards, this is here. Don't blame us, blame the people at the Council of Europe. So the first myth-busting break. So Cambridge, has been more lenient with the Common European Framework because we do hear people saying that we changed the exam in 2016 and this was not the first time we changed it. Actually, uh, first, B2 first, be sort of the first certificate in English goes all the way back to the 1930s. If I showed you a first uh, from 1935, the first time we did it, I can guarantee that it is going to look really different from today's. Uh, so, but, so have we actually become more lenient? Are we just making the test dumber and easier so that people feel great about getting a better score? Let's look at, well, actually we are not, we are just testing to the same standards. Sort of the standards haven't changed. Uh, so, the other side of that, and we hear both sides of a coin, is that since we uh, since we do this, since we changed the exam or over time, the results have gone down, uh, especially, and there is a lot of myths with this about writing specifically, that the scores for writing are really going down. I mean, you're being very strict. I don't know what it is you're doing in Cambridge. So let's look at the numbers for that. If we look at the scores for Argentina, okay? And if we look at the results going all the way back to a few years ago and seeing what happened over time. Okay, I don't know what is happening he here. Here we go. Okay, so by the way, apologies, but I am going to change um, the way I, I am sharing this. Apologies. Apologies. Uh, I am going to start sh just sharing my screen here because it's not particularly comfortable on my end. Um, can you see my screen now? Yep. So, uh, 
So if we look at the overall averages, remember that our exams are graded on the Cambridge English scale. So if you look at the averages for uh, going into 2015, 16, 17, 19 and 21. You can see that the overall results for first have actually not changed at all. You can see actually that if you look at the average results, the results within a very narrow margin, the results are actually going up. But just we're talking about a fraction of things. We're talking about just a few points. But the results for first are not going down even. And this is really interesting. For 2021. Because this is the year after the pandemic. This is last year. So if you look at the results for last year. The results for last year haven't changed at all. OK, now now we're talking. So uh, and then. The other so this is a myth busted and this is also an interesting takeaway for you. Which is. Um, which is what happened, this idea that whatever happened last year was devastating for our learners that whatever happened in 1920, 1921 really affected the learning of our students. What this is showing us is that, yes, there was definitely a lot going on, but the students who, cho who chose to sit for their exams did not see any impact of that, of, of all of those changes in their actual scores when they went back to doing the exam. Um, and then another myth, is that for schools exams are easier than standard versions of first, that there is a difference. So to put things to bed, the reason we have for schools exams, as I'm sure you know, and I'm, as I'm sure the, the people at the center have told you time and again, is because we cannot really expect people who are 15, 16 at, of school age to have the same life experience and to have the same use of the same needs in terms of language use and the same use for things in the world to be familiar with the same language contexts than people who are more who, than grown ups. So if you look at um, if you think of work environments, if you think of business related transactions, if you think of certain topics which are more connected with the adult world and you ask teenagers to write about that, to speak about that, to read about that. When you look at what they do, are you looking at the effect of their language and competence or are you looking at the effect of how familiar they are with those topics? Um, to give you a familiar example, my daughter sat for first last year. She's 16 and she got, well, I am a proud father, so I am happy to say that she got an A. Uh, and this year at, in her high school, they they included um, one kind of workshop in which they are looking at a work related language, more like a business English context sort of. She's in the last year of secondary school, so kind of like beginning to prepare them for the world of work, which is amazing. So they are using a business English course book and she showed me a piece of writing that she had done for one of the activities in the business English course book. And it was amazing because it was fascinating, and I'm sure you've seen this before, uh, which is that the writing was great. I mean, she was using all the right words and the format. She was she had to give an opinion about some aspect of business, and formally it was a very solid text. However, the things that she was saying made no sense. Why did they make no sense? Because she has no experience and no real views about that kind of thing. This is not where she's coming from. This is not where her experience is. This is not something that she's really familiar with. So are we so that is the reason for for schools exams for schools exams have kinds of tasks 
and choices of topics in the texts and uh, things which are more, which we know are going to be more familiar to learners at that age because it wouldn't be fair really to grade, to look at something and not know if you're looking at a language competence issue or if you're looking at a knowledge of the world issue, to go back to our communicative language teaching terminology of knowledge of language, knowledge of the world. And to show you that, let's look at the results for B2First versus B2First for schools in Argentina. And if you look at, so this is the grade distribution. What is the percentage of candidates that got an A, a B, a C, a level B1 or a not reported at first for Argentina on the whole? I'm just taking a very big, sort of a very broad bird's eye view of the, of the last five years of exams. And this is exactly what you want to see. I mean, when you're looking at a competence exam like first, you expect most people to be towards the middle of the competence band. But a very good thing to say is that if you look at the B's and the A's, there are a lot more candidates in there. There are There is a much higher percentage of candidates in there than the level B ones are not reported, which means all of your good work, teachers, which is that learners are very well prepared for that. If you look at the scores for B to first for schools, you see a slightly different distribution, but are you really seeing a significant difference? Do you see a lot more people getting Bs or getting As than getting Cs? Actually, what you're looking at is pretty similar, not to say almost identical. The differences are like maybe one, two, three percent going north or south on either of, the, of these exams. But there is nothing here that is rocking anybody's world. So this is a myth busted. The exams are not easier. The exams are not harder. The exams are just different in terms of some of the content in there. The skills that they're assessing at the level that they're assessing them at and how difficult candidates are finding those are exactly the same. And this is the reason why when you get the certificate, you can use them for exactly the same things. So let's talk about B2 writing now. So this time, this is time for you to fill in the gaps. Uh, I have written the self-assessment state sentence, which is like the broadest description within the common European framework of B2 writing, what I can do if I am a B2 learner with my writing with some blanks. What I would like you to do in the chat box is to fill in the gaps. You know how to do this. You know how to play this game. Let's play the game. So go for it and let's see what you come up with. So I'm giving you some help. You have a C, a D, a W, an E, an I and an S. So, any takers? So I hear people say I can produce clear detailed texts on a wide range of subjects, clear descriptions, wide emails. I see people suggesting wide an essay, wide email should definitely be in there, clear and detailed. We agree that so, sort of we have a consensus that clear and detailed should be somewhere in there. Some people say essay instead of email. OK. It's a game now. So sort of we have a competition. Game on. Oh, 
let's skip to the goal line, to the goal line a few seconds write an essay or report passing on information yep i didn't see much about the i people so lots of clear and detailed we have the debate about essays and emails the or throws me off says somebody okay let's see so five four three two one the winners are in Oh, and nobody picked up on the S at the end. Come on. Uh, I can write clear and detailed text on a wide range of subjects related to my interests. I can write an essay or report, no emails, sorry, passing on information or giving reasons in support of or against a particular point of view. I can write letters highlighting the personal significance of events and experiences. So, um, Let's look at what this means in context, because we have this statement for B2. Let's look at the level above and the level below. OK. If we look at the previous level, the same self-assessment sentence for writing. And by the way, I didn't make these up. This comes from you can go to the Council of Europe website and download a bunch of materials. There is the original Common European Framework document of 2002. There is the uh, there is the annex uh, of 2018. There is a new version that came out in 2020. And each of those is a bunch of pages. There is a very useful spreadsheet, which is the one the thing that I normally go for. Uh, there is a spreadsheet where you can filter by by skill, uh, sort of by band, by skill, by definition, and you can look up all of the different descriptors. There is a bunch of stuff in there, and there are also recordings and webinars and lots of activities. If you want to know more about what the framework is, how it was built, how Cambridge is a part of that, because we are very proud to we are very proud to have been part of the history of the development of the framework since its very inception, since its very beginning in the 1970s. Uh, the Cambridge assessment and, and many of our key researchers have been authors of those documents or co-authors of those documents and remain to be. So we are very much embedded in all of this. So anyway, going, so going one step back, B1 is I can write simple connected text on topics which are familiar or of personal interest. I can write personal letters describing experiences and impressions. And C1, one level above, is I can express myself in clear, well-structured text, expressing points of view at some length. I can write about complex subjects in a letter, an essay or a report, underlining what I consider to be the salient issues. I can select style appropriate to the reader in mind. So this is what the level above and the level below look like. What are the highlights of each of these levels? So to me, at least, the highlights, the salient points of B2 are that it's clear and detailed, that there is this thing about the for and against. It talks about a wide range of subjects and it talks about highlighting the personal significance. What is relevant to me about that? What this means to me? If we go one above, you can see how this become sort of one below, sorry, into B1. You can see how this changes because it talks about, instead of clear and detailed, it talks about simple and connected. Sort of, and instead of the focus on something that is well organized, it simply says simple and connected text. And it talks about personal letters describing experiences and impressions. So areas that change, simple versus simple and connected versus clear and detailed. And then this thing about going into a wider range of subjects. If you look at the framework and if you look at the progression across all of the skills, the, these are definitely some of the dimensions in which things begin to open up. As you go up the levels, you go from very personal experience and just talking about myself to talking about a wider and wider a wider range of subjects, things which are more distant from myself and my personal experiences. If you look at the focus, the first things you learn at like the initial bands, A1, A2, etc., like your very beginning, the first thing you learn is to talk about yourself. 
my name is, I live here. Then you talk about your family, then you talk about your home, then you talk about your city. So it begins to open up because you want to talk about more things in the world and you have the language to do that. So, and this is true also if we look at the level above, because C1 talks about well-structured text. It's not just clear and detailed, it's clear and well-structured, it has to be well-built. Talking about points of view at some length, so not just presenting a view, but developing it well. And then it talks about appropriate style. I can select style appropriate to the reader in mind. And this is also one of the key differences between B2 and C1, because B2 focuses on, I can present my ideas. I, what I was telling you before, with some strain, and I can make myself understood. C1 is about, I can do it appropriately. I can do this well. I can do this use, choosing from a, from a broad range of resources and choosing the one that is best for this context. This is the challenge for those of us who teach classes beyond the level of B2, because when you go into level C1, C2, when you go beyond B2, you are not just developing, how can I say this in English, but how can I say this in English in different ways, which are the different, which is the specific impact of each of these different ways of doing it. One is a more specific word than the other, one is more formal or less formal than the other, one is going to make me look or feel like this or that. So it's not just about I can explain my ideas or I can present my ideas to you. It is about I can present my ideas to you and, be, and give you the, a very specific impression about who I am, the way I talk and what I am saying. It is the example that I always give is if you are a doctor at level B2, uh, you are at the level where you can understand what is wrong with your patient and you can tell them what the treatment is going to be. If you, at C1 or C2, I expect you to be able to do that, but I want, but I expect you to be able to speak like a doctor, to, to give, to project the impression that you are a doctor. And when you are going home, or if you're speaking to a friend or a colleague at the corridor, I expect you to speak differently to adjust to that. So this is what happens when you go into C1s and C2s, you are beginning to narrow down, which is why when you go into C1 and C2, you have to relearn many, you are not actually learning to do more things. There isn't much more that you can do with English than you do at B2. I mean, you can basically handle many contexts. Yes, you are going to learn a lot more about writing academic stuff and argumentative stuff. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of things but you're going to be learning to expand your world, going into more dialects, going into a broader range of resources. And in terms of production, you're going to learn how to do it. You're going to relearn how to do it, to do it more specifically, to do it more precisely, more appropriately. So, which means that you shouldn't be expecting these things, sort of this degree of appropriacy to happen at B2. If you are being too hard on these things, you are actually looking one level above, you're being a bit more demanding than we would be at this level. So, myth-busting break. Cambridge English exams are more difficult than IELTS and other multi-level tests. No, because we are actually testing to the same standards. We are, it is not that if you go and do IELTS, it's going to be easier or harder to get a 6.0 or a 6.5 than to get a first. They are at the same level. They look at different things, slightly different things in your language. IELTS Academic is going to look at different things and IELTS General, and then Lingua Skill is going to be looking at different things and this or that. But if a test is done well, and we like to think that ours are done well, uh, you and you get a same candidate, you get a same learner doing the same, doing exams, they should be getting a very similar score. Maybe not precisely the same score, because the exams are, the tasks themselves are going to change slightly, and there may be more familiarity with one thing than another. I mean, there, there are a number of factors going on in there. But if you ask a candidate to sit for three exams, 
which are well built on the same day, don't do it because they're going to be very exhausted at the end of the process, uh, they should be getting very similar scores. So it's not that they're easier or harder, it's just that we are sort of, they sh you should be getting the same stuff. You can use it for different purposes, but that's a conversation for another day. You will have a better score if you use lots of complicated words, lots of phrasal verbs, lots of idioms, lots of whatever. You are going to impress us if you use very, if instead of saying however, so in, if, if you use but, if you use however instead of but every single time, or if you drop in 50 different idioms. Well, if we asked you to write a report for your class and you drop 50 different idioms in a report for your class, giving your reasons for or against something, normal, nobody would drop 50 idioms on that unless they're trying to show off the language. So there isn't one thing that we are looking at. There isn't like one score where we count the number of idioms, where we count the number of this, where we count the number of that. And there isn't definitely this idea of we deduct points for this or that. I'm going to show you how this works in a few minutes, but it, I can guarantee from the beginning that it doesn't work like that. And first is not enough to understand texts at university level. Well, actually, if you go back to the descriptors that we were talking about, first is actually defined to as a level in which you can begin your university studies. B2 is the level in which most requirements for undergraduate universities are placed in Europe and the UK. C1, the level above, is the level in, that is usually expected or required uh, for people who are going to study masters and postgraduate courses. But why is that? Because when you are studying a master's course or a postgraduate course or a PhD, a lot of the things that you're going to do are basically going to be about producing content. You're going to be writing a dissertation. You're going to be giving out lectures. You're going to be writing stuff a lot more than you do at graduate level. So a lot of the skills which we are not going to go deep into, but that you do see at the levels C1 and C2, are about developing views at length. If you have to write a dissertation, which is going to be 100, 200 pages, I think describing things, I think developing ideas at length is going to be involved at some stage. But if you're going to study like a first year, second year course at a university, this is the level in which you can understand and be, continue to develop your specialist language. This is the level in which you can do a basic classroom writing task at university level. This is good enough. Then you need to develop it further, but that's a different story. So busted. Now, so let's talk about other B2 writing descriptors because we looked at the most general ones. What else is in there? So these are just some of the many, many, many descriptors of sub areas of writing that you can find within the Common European Framework for B2. So we are still at the same level. So can produce clear detailed texts on a, on a variety of subjects related to their field of interest, synthesizing and evaluating information and arguments from a number of sources. So this idea of bringing ideas from different places and pulling them together is within B2. Do practice that in your classrooms can give clear detailed descriptions of real or imaginary events and experiences, marking the relationship between ideas in clear connected texts and following established conventions of the genre concerned, which is why we put a lot of focus on what is the genre that you are writing in? What is the kind of text? So if you're writing a narrative, if you're writing a letter, if you're writing a report, an essay or whatever, it needs to feel different, but you need to be able to do these things can produce an essay or report which develops an argument systematically with appropriate highlighting of significant points and relevant supporting detail. This feels a lot like the essay task in first, what it is asking you to do. Can produce an essay or report which develops an argument, giving reasons in support of or against a particular point of view and explaining the advantages and disadvantages of various options, a basic for and against argumentative piece can compose formal correspondence, such as letters of inquiry, request, application, and complaint, using appropriate register, structure, and conventions. This translates into emails as well. We are in 2021. I don't expect you to be writing a letter with a quill and, with quill and ink. 
uh, yes, nobody is going to go and pluck a feather from a goose when they need to write a letter of complaint. We do type it up on an email, but we still do it following certain conventions. Can you use formality and conventions appropriate to the context when writing personal and professional letters and emails? So there is going to be something in there about being appropriate for the context and developing a degree of formal English and being able to tune it to some degree based on the context where you are writing. We don't expect you to be perfect at that, but we expect you to be able to do that. When you're writing the essay in first, it doesn't need to, it shouldn't feel like an Instagram post. It should feel like an essay. So let's talk about writing at B2 first. So you can assess writing in a lot of different ways. This is the first Cambridge English exam ever, which was a certificate of proficiency in English in 1913. These were the tasks. Now, on a scale of one to 10, please type in the chat box what score you feel that you would have gotten with these t writing tasks. Mine would be somewhere between the three and a four, I guess, but that is because one of the things that I studied and taught uh, as, I mean, when I left teacher training college was literature. So actually for me, writing about Elizabethan travel and discovery would have felt kind of comfortable. Uh, and then Matthew Arnold is an author that I love. So I could write about Dover Beach, but, uh, and I could write about uh, maybe, uh, no, yeah, I would go for Matthew Arnold and Elizabethan Travel and Discovery. I don't think pre-Raphaelites, I didn't really care much for the Barrett Brownings. Uh, and the effect of political movements upon 19th century literature in England, I could say something about that because I love Dickens. I could say something, uh, but I think, yeah, uh, minus one, Agustina, I, I feel that. I see lots of ones or twos, less than three for sure. Yeah, fail, I would fail. Uh, yes, uh, I'm with you on that one. But that is not because Cambridge were crazy. This was a different exam looking at very different things. However, I think we all agree that this was testing a lot more than just writing. Actually, you could be an excellent writer and still fail this. But, I mean, I'm sure you can take most people who would sit for a proficiency today and pass it with an A, present them with this writing, with these writing tasks, uh, and they would all fail, like most, every single one of them. So what is in the writing paper for B2First? How did we get better at this over 108 years? Not better, but how did the use of this change? How, I mean, I need to explain that this test was developed for people who were traveling to England and wanted to become teachers in the UK education system. Okay, so this was an exam that was going to be used to assess the, to, this was actually assessing how competent you were to go, into a, to go into a school and teach what was called English, which was actually more like literature and history and culture and things like that. So these questions were things that were important to know for that particular context, that particular use. It's not that they were just choosing difficult stuff for people to fail. Having said that, three people passed, sat for this exam, and this was one of the seven components of the exam. And I think that all three of them failed. So on 1913. So uh, everything they say about Cambridge exams is, tr is true. They ask you about impossible things. They are too difficult, too long, and everybody fails. So uh, what is in the writing paper today? It's one hour and 20 minutes. It's got two parts. Part one is an essay. So between 140 and 190 words, we will talk about that later. There is an essay title plus two ideas, and you have to add a third idea of your own. And part two is a situationally based task, which is also 140 to 190 words. There is a choice between three prompts, which can be an article, an email or a letter, a report or a review. And if you are doing first for schools, you have a choice of writing a story, and then you have a choice of writing about the uh, extended reading set text, which I know not many of you go for. There is a set, there are set texts for first for schools, 
uh, I hope you are all doing extended reading. Whether you choose to use the books that we suggest for the exam or not is up to you. But I def but I certainly, but I really, really hope that you're doing some extended reading other than just the course book in your lessons. And I know you are. Now, so uh, just a tiny word about 140 and 190 words limit. People, no one is counting. There is no red pen that we used to draw a line and then we will not read anything beyond word 141. Maybe we have a tolerance for 145, but the rest of it gets deleted. No one's doing that. Uh, if you if you write 50 words, you're not going to get punished for writing 50 words. However, if you write 50 words, what is definitely going to happen is that in 50 words, you are either James Joyce, so a genius, and you can say everything you have to do, and you can do everything you have to do in that task in 50 words, which is a mastery of English language at level F26, or you haven't done all the things you need to do. You haven't talked about, if you're doing the essay, you haven't introduced the topic, you haven't presented two ideas, and you haven't presented a third idea of your own, because in 50 words, how are you ever going to do that? So you are going to get punished for not covering all the ideas. Punished means your score is going to go down because you haven't said all the things you need to say. You haven't talked about all the things you need to talk about. That is what is going to happen if you write 50 words. If you write 300 words, what is probably going to happen is that you're going to start saying things that we didn't ask you to say, talking about more things, saying additional stuff. And this goes for every exam, not just first. We are going to, we do, and I'm going to show you how, look at relevance of the content. So if you write irrelevant stuff, stuff that was not in the task, your score will suffer for it. And if you write more words than 190 for this kind of task, one of two things will probably happen. One is that you will start, is that you will probably start say writing things that were not included in the task that we didn't ask you to write about and that is irrelevance and that the more you write the more chances for errors to happen so you will make more spelling errors you will make more grammar errors your prepositions are likely to start going all over the place if you write more so or there are more opportunities for that to happen so if you're writing more you're just setting up yourself up for problems but we are not going to punish you for writing more than those numbers of words. That is a range that is there to give you an idea of how many words we estimate this number is. If you write less than 140, you probably haven't done all the things you need to do in that task. Or maybe you are James Joyce and you have. Although if you are James Joyce, specifically, you've probably written 50 pages. But and if you have written 300 words, you have probably included things that you shouldn't have. That is the problem. The problem is not how many words, is what are you going to be able to do in those words? So the essay task, I've mentioned at least five times why we need to have it. We didn't introduce it because we hate teachers. The reason we introduced it and we published this in our research notes in November 2015 before the exam came out is that the essay task engages appropriate cognitive processes for university writing. So levels of cognitive processing from micro planning to revising. And then there is knowledge telling versus knowledge transformation. In an essay, you have to bring different ideas together. You have to present them and you have to develop them. And that is definitely something that happens at the B2 level that needs to happen. And an essay is an excellent way to see whether that is happening. It offers a greater opportunity to display the range of language because it, it goes into slightly more formal ways of writing. It is a useful and relevant function for candidates to become skilled in. This is something that you need to do as a writer in real life. Whether you're writing an e if you're writing an email presenting your views, you're not writing an essay, but you're writing an email to your boss later in life talking about why we do this or not, you are writing a for or against text. 
and then it has a positive impact on classrooms because it encourages debate and opinion pieces and it focuses on planning and editing. We didn't do this because we hate teachers and learners. We did this for all of these reasons. The fact that it made, our, it made your lives and your learners' lives difficult was just icing on the cake. So uh, the essay task, what candidates must do? They must address both prompts and they must introduce a third distinct idea of their own. They must ensure that all the content of the essay is clear and easy to follow. They must have effective organization and cohesion. They must use a range of structures to communicate ideas and opinions. They must use appropriate vocabulary so that is appropriate for the context. Some pro tips, things that will help your learners do this well. Read the rubric, read the prompts, read the essay question, focus. Don't just write stuff about the topic, go back to the rubric. This goes for every task in every exam. Practice pros and cons and brainstorming for the third topics. So choosing four ideas for or against, but also they will need to introduce the third topic. Practice that. Work on clear and logical development of ideas. And this is not your fault, this is not your learner's fault, this has nothing to do with English. One thing that is happening, especially to teenagers today, is that, I mean, if you talk to university teachers, uh, familiarity with more academic and formal types of discourse, both as readers and writers, is an issue in Spanish. The, nobody is born being a writer. Nobody is born being an essay writer. Nobody is born being an argumentative piece writer. These are things that we develop and that we have to teach. So we need to teach each of the mini skills that go into it. Organization, cohesion, so practice those, edit, do exercises on editing, self-assessment, peer assessment, correcting other people, look at a piece that is well done and look at what makes it well done. So practice those things. This is going to help them write in their own language as well. This is not English specific. Build a repertoire of structures, of linkers, of formulas. So all of each of these things, which is actually coming down to the old process writing idea of look at each of the processes that go into doing a good essay and break them down and practice each of those things individually. Let's talk about assessment criteria now. This is when I tell you how we correct. So I'm going to be blabbing on for a while about this. And it's already 11, so if it's okay with you, we might be going over for maybe 15 more minutes, if that is okay with everybody. So, cont so which are the, there are four subscales that we assess. One is content, and content answers the basic question of how well has the candidate fulfilled the task? There is communicative achievement, which looks at how appropriate the writing is for the task, and whether the candidate has used the appropriate register, so appropriacy. Organization, which looks at the way the candidate puts together the piece of writing. Is it logical? Is it ordered? Are the ideas linked together well? And then there is language, which focuses on vocabulary and grammar, including range and accuracy. So, four areas. Each of them weighs a little bit differently. But notice how things like your spelling and your tenses are one factor of grammar and vocabulary, sort of grammar and vocabulary are one factor of the language subscale. It's not everything there is to it. Actually, there is a lot more to it. If we focus too much on that and we don't put the same emphasis on the rest, we are focusing on a fraction of 25% and we are not really looking at the 75, 80% that is beyond that. And then we are surprised that a learner who has amazing vocabulary and uses all the right collocations didn't get it right. Well, maybe they were not appropriate. They, maybe they were choosing the wrong content. Maybe they were not organizing their text well, but they were doing it with beautiful prepositions. Sorry, I don't mean to be too bold, but this could be happening. And then maybe we are focusing on a bit of it, and at Cambridge we want to focus on the whole of it, because what we are looking at is somebody who can do 
all of the B2 things that I told you about earlier, not just. So let's talk a little bit about what are the key questions for each of these subskits. What is a written writer looking at when they look at content? And by the way, the stuff I'm going to show you now, don't tell anybody, uh, this comes directly from the manuals which are used to train writing raters. Okay? The training of writing raters goes, for those of you who know about speaking examiners, it goes pretty much the same way. There is some initial training, then there is standardization, and there is a whole bunch of other processes that happen, kind of similarly to what happens in writing, in speaking, with the advantage that with writing you can go back and review the texts. And you cannot really do that with speaking because we don't record the exams. So uh, this is what it, this is the stuff that they see when they begin the process. Don't tell anybody I showed you this because I'm not really sure if I am allowed to do this, but I love you so much that here it goes. So content. Responses that have covered all the required elements correctly, even if not appropriately have developed those elements that require development and contain no irrelevances should receive a five. By the way, you get a score between one and five for each of these bands, and then those scores are weighted. You look at one for this, three for that, and there are formulas to go from that to a numeric score, which I cannot share with you. But um, so what are they looking at? Responses that covered all the required elements correctly, develop those elements that require development and contain no irrelevances should receive a five. People, somebody who has been trained well as a writer, who has been taught well as a writer, if we have done our jobs correctly, there is no easier way to say this. There is no excuse for not getting a five for content. Because if you don't get a five for content, it means that you haven't read the instructions and that you haven't done the things that you were supposed to do. If you are right, if you are at preliminary and you have to write an email uh, responding to another email and saying, asking what time you want to meet to go to the cinema and suggesting a film, it means that you haven't asked what time to go to the cinema and you haven't suggested the film. There is no excuse for not getting a five for content. We need to train our learners for this and we need to look at this when we are grading the stuff that they write during the course. Responses are marked down if there is incorrect information. So a figure provided doesn't match with a chart, for instance. If there is irrelevant information or if development is not provided where it is required, like a content element which asks and candidates to describe, to say why, to argue, etc. And these things are extremely relevant for the essay topic. What about communicative achievement? So, Question number one, are the conventions of a communicative task followed? Does the essay read like an essay? Does the email read like an email? Does the report read like a report? Does the response hold the target reader's attention? Does it do this effectively, flexibly, or convincingly? And effective, flexible, or convincing is stuff that is going to help you grade people. So if, you just, if you're just able to give somebody enough of a hook to read from beginning to end. It doesn't mean that it needs to read like an Agatha Christie novel. It means that it needs to be well constructed so that you can understand and follow the argument. How simple, straightforward or complex are the ideas being communicated? And this is going to grade things based on a scale. Remember that one of the differences between B1 and B2 was going from simple and connected to clear and detailed. So is this clear and detailed or more like simple and connected? If this is more like simple and connected, not a great score for that. Were all communicative purposes achieved? Did you do all of the things that you need to do with this? Okay, and this includes at level B2, are you formal informal enough? Not too specifically because that is definitely going to be way more intense in C1, but at this level, your essay needs to read like an essay. If it doesn't, we are in trouble. If it reads like an Instagram post, we're in trouble. And organization. Is the text connected, generally well organized, well organized, a well organized whole, or impressively organized? We are not going to go into details into what each of these means, but I think this gives you a sense of where we stand. 
Is it just connected like one, one sentence next to the other? Is it a well-organized whole? Can you see from beginning to end how this is going? What is the level at which this is happening? Among linking words, cohesive devices and organizational patterns, which is the highest order device employed? Are the devices used appropriately and to generally good effect with flexibility or with complete flexibility? And again, this is about setting up layers of competence, like um, linking words, cohesive devices and organizational patterns. Linking words are the easy ones, and or but. Pattern, um, organ um, cohesive devices are when you expand that into more things like connecting one paragraph to the next into using all of the all of the resources all of the linking cohesive devices that we definitely start developing at level b2 we we spend a lot of time on this when we develop writing but there is one more layer which is when you are a more sophisticated writer and you start for doing things like chains of reference so that we are referring to the same person with five different words so we say Lionel messi uh, the psg striker Argentina's greatest footballer, the most expensive player in football history, uh, the shortest player in football history. So all of those things are, so that kind of chain of reference, also including things like he. But this is just a silly example. This is a very simple example, but this is one way in which we can use a chain of reference to bring a text together. And this is definitely a more elaborate skill. Because if we, if we are teaching people at B2 level, we are still at the level where messy, 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 messy is good enough. But if you're teaching C1 and C2, messy, 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 messy is going to be messy. Um, then, within the parameters of a task, how much variety is there in the use of these devices? And again, this is very level specific. At level B2, we are not expecting the universe, but we are expecting to see some of this and or but and or but 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 and and or or is not going to cut it at b2 level it's not a capital sin but it's not what you would like to see now language focus on the vocab so what are the things that we are looking at focus on the vocabulary and the structure descriptors identify the type of vocabulary is it everyday vocabulary or less common the structure, simple or complex used, then the range and variety of these, then what proportions of these are used in which fashion, with some control, good control, full control, generally, appropriately, appropriately, precisely, with sophistication. So, the scale that you see here from some control to sophistication is really going to bring you all the way from A to B1, which is where we begin applying these criteria, all the way up to C2. You expect to see full sophistication at level C1 and C2, really. Some control is good enough for B1. Control is good enough for B2. You don't expect to see full sophistication at first. Sort of it's, it's, it's beyond what you expect to see. And we talk a lot about these two ideas of control, of range and control. Range is how broad is your range of, of tools and control is do you use them for the right things? Do you use them well, appropriately? Yes, I can see that you can do a conditional type three, but are you using it where you would use a conditional type three? Use the accuracy or error descriptors only as a tie breaker if necessary. I'm sorry I'm breaking your hearts, people, but if there is, if you are looking at a piece of writing and you are unsure if it is a band five or a band three for language, then you would look at the accuracy descriptors, how many spelling mistakes, how many this, how many that were, and then you say, okay, then this goes more towards a five than a three or a three than a five. And this is the use of accuracy for writers. That's it. That's the secret sauce. That's the Coca-Cola formula right there. So if you are paying a lot of emphasis on accuracy and you're putting a lot of weight on accuracy when you are assessing your learner's writing, when you are making a decision for yourself about how good or bad someone is and not looking at the other things. So maybe their arguments are a bit rambling, but look at those collocations, dude. Uh, then probably there is a problem right there because you are overestimating something that the raters are. And mind you, it's not that you are the problem. 
And it's not that we are the problem. It's just that we are not matching. We are not aligning. So it's not that the way you're doing it is bad. I am not going to tell you that. I, I don't know you that well. But and, and you didn't bring me here to tell you that anything is great or sucks. But I can tell you about the way this is done at Cambridge. And if you are looking, if you are making a judgment about how well or badly you think that someone is going to do at first, then maybe the, if, the, if the criteria that you're using is not in the same place as the criteria of the raters, then you will find out that you think somebody's here and the raters think they're here or vice versa. So I'm just telling you this so that you know how we do it at Cambridge. And then you make your own decisions. I am not here to tell you what is best for your students or for yourself. I'm here to tell you about how we do it at Cambridge. In peak, so if you look at the scales, and you can see them in the handbooks for the manuals, by the way, I'm going to show them to you now briefly, but you can, you can see this in a lot more detail in other documents. Impede communication in those, uh, in those descriptors mean getting in the way of meaning. Meaning can still be determined, which you can see in some of those descriptors, indicates that some effort is required from the reader to determine meaning. So we talk about this a lot that we only consider a mistakes and error serious when it gets in the way of meaning. So we do the same. So the marking criteria then includes two things, things connected with lower level writing and higher level writing. So, or kind of includes different levels of challenge. For lower level writing, things like focus on control of language and a limited freedom are basically features of the exams. If you look at the writing that happens at young learner exams, the writing tasks at A2, the writing tasks at preliminary, sort of the tasks for key or preliminary, you will see that they are very limited. They are very much guided. If you look at the writing tasks for advanced and proficiency, they are way open. First is right in the middle of that. We haven't, so we are giving you, like, for instance, the essay. You have to put three arguments, but only one of them we are not giving you. So there is a transition here from things, from the focus on control of language and limited freedom to what happens at higher level, right? So this is what we call knowledge telling. And higher level writing is has a focus on organization and register because you are assuming that a control of language is is something that you just take for granted at these levels. And then there is increased freedom. And these tasks focus more on knowledge transforming. At lower level writing, the challenge is language and organization. At higher level writing, the challenge is communicative achievement, doing the thing appropriately for that context, for that thing. First, B2 is a transitional moment where for some people, for some learners, I mean, it is expected that control is still something that you do not quite take for granted, but the level of sophistication that comes with C1 and C2 is something you haven't achieved yet. So it is there in the middle. And so, but we do need to start putting more focus on this communicative achievement than we did when we were teaching. Maybe just thinking of the classic, uh, uh, six year course followed by a first course and then moving into advanced and proficiency. Uh, when you were doing like adults one, two, three, four, five, six, you were just praising people for using the present perfect. At this level, we are still going to expect you to do that, but you need to start focusing a little bit more on the appropriacy than you did before. Because appropriacy was not something that you were going to burden them with when they were struggling to decide if a verb was regular or irregular. But at this level, we expect you to start putting more focus on that, on organizing a text well, on being more sophisticated. And that involves going into more of the knowledge transforming than the knowledge telling areas. So what does each band look like for first? This is what they do. So by the way, you can see this, this, this chart came from the B2 First Handbook for Teachers. You can download it from the website, you can get it from your center. If you don't have it, if you haven't seen it, well, that's the first place to go. Uh, so this is 
This is the description of the bands for content. And by the way, the bands for content are the same all the way from preliminary onwards. We are judging the exact same descriptors for all the levels, but the other ones kind of build up. So if you look at the bands for preliminary, you will see that what you see here as band one is a band three in preliminary. What you see here as a band five is a band three. It, what you see here as a band three is a band five in preliminary. So this is what it looks like for communicative achievement, organization and language. Because I want you to download the handbook, because I want you to read it, I am not going to say anything else about this. I'm just going to show you this, okay? Your task is to download the resources that I'm going to share with you in a minute and read it on your own. This is your homework. So myth busting break. You will fail the exam if you write over 190 words or less than 140. We talked about this. Writing are, are corrected by an examiner from the exam center. So if I do bad, it is the exam center fault. It is all Maria Paula and Agustina ruining your lives personally. I know that. I, I get videos from them on WhatsApp every December saying, look at how I am wrecking this band one, boom, in your face. No, that doesn't happen. Every single piece of writing goes back to Cambridge, travels all the way to Europe. And then what we do do is we scan it, we send it to examiners who look at it on a screen. Then there is a rater and then there is the equivalent of a team leader, which is called a senior rater. Uh, for writing, then oversees that, and we do a number of statistical controls and checks and balances. I mean, it's a very complicated bit, it's very technical, but basically, if somebody gets like too high a score in writing compared to how they did in the rest of the exams, we have a second look. If they get a too low a score compared to the rest of the exam, we take a second look. If we look at one rater's results and we see that they tend to be a bit too high or too low, then we have a second look at everything that they write. So there are a number of ways in which one piece of text is going to be looked at by more than one people. And things are going to be reviewed based on a number of criteria. And their writing definitely has an advantage over in over speaking because like i said before we do not record the interviews so there isn't really a chance to regrade an interview but there is a chance and we do do uh, and we do if it if it is called for review the grades for writing also all of the raters just like the raters for speaking are uh, what we call standardized on an annual basis and they are also monitored through random checks on the right on the assessment that they do in the live exams so it is not a perfect process because nothing that relies on human judgment can ever be perfect that is a, a side effect of being human but it is as good as it can be so busted it is not uh, the cultura's fault it is our fault in any case Come on, we all know it's computers correcting the papers anyway. No, I just told you how it's a bunch of people. So, three keys to ace those Bs. Number one, know the level. Understand what B2 is, what B2 isn't. Know the bands, know the descriptors, your homework to go into the handbooks and look at that. And then break it down. Don't ask students to write break down the process of writing into let's talk about how we brainstorm the ideas for the essay let's talk about how we organize them let's talk about how we brainstorm vocabulary that we're going to use for that there are many 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 things happening at the same time in any language process speaking writing listening reading we can go into the details of what happens at each of those but there is always a bunch of stuff that is the nature of language and the brain in fact but so what we need to do, we cannot just ask somebody to write. It is like when you're training for a sport, we don't ask people to just play football. We teach them to run, we teach them to kick a ball, we teach them to pass the ball, we teach them to position themselves and to receive the ball and to do a header and to do all of those things so that they can do them automatically and proficiently when they need them in performance. So. It's the same thing in writing. Break it down into mini processes and treat each of those processes like an individual skill. So resources for teachers. Grab your phones because this is going to involve some QRs. 
And I'm sure that we are going to, and we are definitely going to share the links to all of this later. So, first, your first thing is assessing writing for Cambridge English qualifications, a guide for teachers. We have produced a guide for teachers for each of our exams, from preliminary all the way to advanced, for writing specifically. This describes all of the bands, all of the descriptors. It includes ex examples of actual learner writing graded by gold, what we call gold raters, gold standard raters, very experienced raters, telling you why they chose a band three for language and explaining that for each of those. It gives you tips on how to develop each of the individual tasks, tips for your learners, tips for yourselves. It's everything you need to know about writing. If you haven't downloaded it yet, I hope you do it. It is 11.25 today. You should be doing this at 11.34. Now, lesson plans. There are, this is the link to the area in the, resource for, in the resources for teachers section where we include lesson plans. We do not talk often enough about this, and this is not the most downloaded of our resources, but you have lesson plans covering eight of them. I have chosen for B2 for writing. Lesson plans with activities that will give you 40 minutes worth of it with the reading, with everything you need. It's a lesson ready uh, for each of the individual bits and mini tasks and sub skills that we have been talking about. And finally, hot off the press. This came out literally two weeks ago, 10 days ago, something like that. This is a checklist to improve your writing for B2 candidates. This is a resource that you can use in your classrooms that you can give your students that has a checklist of things that they want to make sure that they look at when they are doing their writing. OK, this goes into the different subs, the different criteria for assessment. This goes into like the questions that you need to ask yourselves to know if you've done it well. So this is everything you need and more. OK, so. Having said all this, let me stop sharing my screen and let me put on my headphones. And just a minute. Let's see if there's, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but this is a great moment to start typing them up. All I have to say is thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that all of these ideas have been useful. So you've got some resources now, you've got some more ideas now, you've got explanations about the way you, we do this, and you've got resources to read more about these things. There is, I don't think there's much more I can do for you today. So uh, I've done all I've done, all I, I've done all I came to do. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and please ask any questions you've got, anything I haven't covered, any anything at all, just put it in the chat box. I see a lot of thank yous, no questions yet. So, oh, thank you for your warm feedback, everybody. Um, what do you do about illegible or just difficult to read handwriting? This is a great question. Um, we make our best honest effort to read. If you have a candidate, who has, so there may be a number of issues why somebody's handwriting is illegible. Some of them are just because they're a doctor or something like that. Uh, me, I have awful handwriting. I, I acknowledge that. I haven't worked hard enough on my calligraphy. But there are people whose handwriting is not great and that has to do with other conditions. That has to do with maybe dyslexia, that may, may have to do with motor skills, that may have to do with other things. For those candidates, special require there is, remember that we have what we call special requirements, which are the ways in which we cater for learners with special education needs, report that to the centre, and the centre is going to report that back to Cambridge. They're going to ask a number of questions, and then we guarantee for that. If you have a student who just has awful handwriting to the point that you cannot really understand them and there is nothing wrong with them, they just have bad handwriting, maybe a computer-based exam is going to be better for them. In a computer-based exam, they're going to type their answers. There is going to be no handwriting element involved. So if you feel that handwriting is going to be an issue, consider computer-based as an option. The exam is the same, 
but they are not going to have to write, they're going to have to type. Um, uh, so, online wrap. So, thank you so much to everybody for the great feedback. I'm just trying to see if there is any any suggestions about handwriting, also from Marianella. Again, if, hand, if you feel that handwriting is definitely going to be a problem and it doesn't fall within special educational needs, it's just bad handwriting. Computer-based as an option, I would definitely consider that. It is the way to get that problem out of the way. Because if something is illegible, then yes, it cannot be graded. And it makes sense because you've written in a way that makes it very difficult for somebody else to understand, regardless of the words hiding behind there. Um, so, so yes, thank you, Maria Paula, for clearing that up about special uh, about special requirements. How can we help students develop their creativity? Even for very guided tasks, young learners seem to have difficulties. Well, that's a great question, Martin. Uh, which for, we need two more. We need four more webinars to cover that. Uh, but and it is one area that I feel very passionately about. But it's not really. I mean, if you're if you're we make sure that the things that they need to do for our exams are guided enough that we are not assessing creativity. That is actually one of the reasons, for instance, with young learners, that we do not ask you to write a story. We give you the pictures and then you connect them. Because actually we are not assessing that. I can say that from my personal experience. I mean, I, I, put a lot of work into my writing from a very early age. I was always a, an avid reader and I was always part of writing workshops since I was 12. So by the time I reached my teacher training college, my professorado, my writing skills, my literary writing skills were quite advanced. So when I was in language one, two, three, and they just gave us tasks like write a story beginning with or write about a day in the life of X, Y, Z, or any of the things that are very open-ended and which are narrative, I knew I was very aware that I had an edge because I knew how to think about, I come up with new ideas, how to organize a text, how to set a character, how to present things. I was a good writer. I mean, and I'm not just saying that to praise myself. I actually won an award for writing a novel, okay? So I, uh, I, it's not something I mention often enough, I guess, but I won the Premio Clarín de Novela in the year 2000. So when I say I am a good writer, it's a statement of fact. So this happened four years after I finished my teacher training college. So it is fair to say that when people were, when teachers were assessing my writing skills based on an open-ended narrative task, I had an unfair advantage over my, over my over my classmates because my skills in writing narrative text were very strong in any language. So was that a fair assessment? The answer is no, because they were looking at different skills. They were trying to assess my language and I was basing my good results on, I hope, my language, but also something else. Now, so that is the reason why we do not have so many open-ended you need your creativity tasks in our assessment because we do not want to judge your creativity. We are not here to do that. We could develop an assessment to look at your creativity. It would look completely different from any of the ones that we do, and it would be for a completely different reason for a completely different group of people. So ways to develop your creativity. There is a bunch. You can look at stuff for developing creative writing. There are uh, Gianni Rodari's Grammatica de la Fantasia is the title that comes to mind, but there are many, many, many others. Now, this is not something that you want to do from your English class alone and for a Cambridge exam. This is one thing you want to do to develop creativity, period. This is definitely something that people should get out of schooling. Uh, but so ways to do this, we need a lot more time to cover that, I'm afraid. But the mm. short answer for that is, do focus on brain. If you're thinking about Cambridge exams and what you need for that, focus on the things you need for the kind of task because it is a good starting point. It is a contained thing. Like, for instance, in first, we give you two topics. You need to come up with a third that is coherent. That is a creative task. We didn't tell you what it was, but we gave you guidance. And the way you develop creativity is actually from big to small. You start with guided stuff and you start getting into more open, more open, more open, more open, until you get to the point where you are facing the blank page. 
the that is like the C2 of cre of creativity in writing. Um, how can we? So I don't see any more questions. So Maria Paula Agustina, I've definitely overstayed my welcome. We mm -hmm. said nine to ten, and it's uh, ten to eleven. And it's already eleven thirty. So I hope you are going to invite me again after overstaying my welcome. <laughs> But in any case, I don't see any more questions, and I think this would be a great time to let people go back to cooking their lunches, I guess, <laughs> and doing the shopping. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pablo. Yes, it's been a, a very, a very uh, entertaining webinar as well, as part of in life. Thank you for that. Share that. Many, many thanks, Pablo. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me to be here as well. So thank you all for coming and hope to see you the next time. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone.